look at the picture on the screen. Over here you will find that a kid is alone in the room and he's playing with a number of blocks. Now as you can see, since the kid is absolutely alone in the room, he is at liberty to form whatever shapes he wants with these blocks. As you can see, the kid has formed this shape using a certain number of blocks. Now in this case, there are two assumptions that we are considering. The first assumption is that these blocks are very sturdy, that is, they do not break even if they fall from a particular height. And the second assumption is that the kid is completely alone in the room and isolated. Or in other words, nobody is coming into the room and taking these blocks out. Neither is anyone coming in the room to give him more number of blocks. Thus, the number of blocks in the room is remaining constant. And with these numbers, the kid can form whatever shapes he wants to. Thus, he can also arrange the blocks in this manner. Over here, as you can see, he is using a greater number of blocks. So no matter how many blocks he uses to form whichever shapes he wants to, whichever shape he wishes, the total number of blocks in the room remains the same. Because we have considered this these blocks do not break and also no block is coming into or going out from the room. Because the room is isolated as well as the kid. And obviously in this room the kid is alone. Now consider these playing blocks as energy blocks. So consider energy to be like these playing blocks and consider them or picture them as energy blocks. So let us see how we can apply the previous analogy in case of energy. We arrive at a very important conclusion that is known as the law of conservation of energy. So what does the law of conservation of energy state? It states that energy can neither be created nor be destroyed. So as in this case, nobody was coming in to give the kid more number of blocks, nor was anybody going out by taking certain number of blocks from this room. Over here, these number of blocks remained fixed. It only changed from one form to another as the kid made shapes. So over also energy changes from one form to another. That is, it is not created or destroyed, but it merely changes from form to form and the total amount of energy remains constant in a system. So over here, we have considered that these blocks are unbreakable, so they cannot be destroyed, and that they are also remaining constant for this particular room. So likewise, the total amount of energy in a system also remains constant, because over here, we can say that the room is a system, because it has been kept under observation. Likewise energy in the system also remains constant. Now consider the universe at large. If we keep the entire universe under observation, we can say that the universe is also a system and a very very large system at that. So if we consider the universe as a system, we can say that the total universal energy or the total energy in the universe is a constant. So now I have a question for you. The question is, according to the law of conservation of energy, which one do you think is true? That energy is indestructible. That energy changes forms. Energy in the universe is constant. Or all of the three? The correct answer is all of the three. Because as we have studied, according to the law of conservation of energy, energy can neither be created nor be destroyed. So it is indestructible. Energy, however, changes from one form to another. That is known as the interconversion of energy. So obviously, it changes forms. And we have also seen that if we place the entire universe under observation, that is, if we consider the universe as a large isolated system, then we can say that the energy in the universe is also a constant. So all these three are true. And thus, this is the correct answer. Now observe this video. Over here, we will proceed to prove the conservation of energy for the ball which is falling from a given height. 
the top of the building to the bottom of the building. Now, when the ball is falling from the top of the building to the bottom of the building, it possesses both kinetic energy as well as potential energy. Why? Because when it is falling, it has a certain amount of velocity. So, we can say that it has kinetic energy. Also, when the ball is falling, it is placed at a certain position above the ground that it has a certain height from the ground. Thus, it also has potential energy. Now, we have to prove that in traversing from the top of the building to the bottom, that is from the roof to the ground, the total energy of the ball remains constant. That is, the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy is constant. This is what we have to prove. So initially we consider the height of the building is h, that is from the bottom to the top and the mass of the ball is m. So with this information, let us see how we can proceed to prove the law of conservation of energy. So initially we consider position a. At position a, that is the top of the building, the height of the ball is h from the ground and the velocity at a is 0 because the ball has been kept at rest. So what can we say? We can say that the potential energy that is given by mgh will be m, that is the mass of the ball, g, that is the acceleration due to gravity, into h, that is the height of the ball from the ground. Also, we can say that the kinetic energy is 0. Why? Because u, that is the velocity at a, is 0 because the ball is at rest. Thus, the kinetic energy is 0. Also, we found out that the potential energy is m into g into h. Thus, we can say that the total energy, the total energy is nothing but a sum total of the kinetic energy and the potential energy, which is 0 plus m into g into h, which gives us mgh. So the total energy at position A is equal to mgh. Thus, this is the total energy at position A. Now let us move on to position B. At position B, the ball has fallen a certain height from the top and it is still at a height from the bottom. So let us say the ball has been displaced by h1. So the height of the ball from the ground is h minus h1. That is this particular height, h minus h1. That is the height from ground is h minus h1. And the velocity at b at this point is v1. So now we are going to use the third equation of motion that is v square equals u square plus 2 a s. So in this case, since the ball is falling under the influence of gravity, we write v square is equals u square plus 2 into acceleration due to gravity g into h. That is the distance it is falling. In this case, h1. So, we write v1, which is the velocity at b, u, that is the initial velocity of the ball at a, which is 0 because the ball was at rest. a is the acceleration due to gravity, and s, that is the distance from a to b, which is h1. So, using this information, we can write by replacing the values v as v1, u as 0 and 2a as g into s which is h1. So what does this give us? This gives us v1 square is equal to 2 into g into h1. Thus we can say v1 square is 2g h1. Now we know that kinetic energy is given by the formula 
half into m into v square where m is the mass of the ball so we found out that the velocity of the ball at point b is nothing but 2 into g into h1 so replacing the value for velocity we can write v1 square or v square by replacing the value of v1 that is 2 into g into h1 so since 2 is common we cancel it out and we are left with mg h1 so thus we can say that the kinetic energy of the ball at b is mg h1 now we have found out the kinetic energy of the ball which is mg h1 and we also know that at b the ball is still at a height h minus h1 from the ground so the potential energy pe will be equal to m into g into its height from the ground which is mg into h minus h1 now we can find out the total energy of the ball at b by simply adding up these two quantities so what will it give us the total energy will be equal to mg h1 that is the kinetic energy plus mg into h minus h1 so if i open the brackets by multiplication i will get mg h1 plus mg h minus mg h1 so as you can see mg h1 and mg h are present in the same equation as a negative as well as a positive so we can cancel these two and what do we get the total energy as we get the total energy as mgh again so even at position b the total energy is mgh so now let us consider what happens at position c at position c the ball is just about to hit the ground so the height of the ball from the ground is zero and it has a velocity of v at point c where it is just about to hit the ground but hasn't hit it as yet so again we apply the third equation of motion by applying the third equation of motion we consider v square equals u square plus 2 as so over here v is the velocity at c u that is the initial velocity at a is equal to 0 because at a the ball was at rest a is the acceleration due to gravity small a which is equal to g because it is falling under the influence of gravity and s is the displacement from a to c which is nothing but the height of the building h so what can we write we can write v square is equal to 0 because the initial velocity is 0 plus 2 into g into h thus we can rewrite this equation as v square is equal to 2 gh now we know that the expression for kinetic energy is half into m into v square so if i replace the value of v square what will i get i will get half into m into 2 gh that is i replace the value of v square and place it in this equation so i can cancel out 2 and i am left with mgh which is the kinetic energy of the ball at point c so i obtained that the kinetic energy of the ball at point c is mgh and the height of the ball at point c from the ground is zero because it is just about to hit the ground so how can i write the potential energy the potential energy pe will be given by m into g into h now since h is zero i can write m into g into zero which will be equal to zero thus the potential energy of the ball is zero again the total energy can be obtained if i sum these two quantities so the total energy 
is nothing but kinetic energy mgh plus potential energy so this again gives us m into g into h thus the total energy of the ball at point c is also mgh so now let us compare the kinetic energy and potential energy at the respective points at point a that is at the topmost point the ball had minimum kinetic energy and maximum potential energy and the total energy was present completely as potential energy mgh at an intermediate point b the kinetic energy was mgh1 and the potential energy was mgh minus h1 and the total energy again was mgh at point c the ball had maximum kinetic energy and minimum potential energy because it was just above the ground so the total energy mgh was present as kinetic energy only now as you can see at all these three positions the total energy of the ball remains the same thus we can say that the total energy at all these points remains constant and hence we have proved the law of conservation of energy now a similar thing happens in case of a pendulum now you will notice that we are displacing the ball of the bob of the pendulum by a certain height over here it is at a certain height h above the ground now the moment we release the bob of the pendulum it starts swinging so let us see how we can analyze this swinging motion when we are releasing the bob of the pendulum from point c it is being released from a height h from the ground so on releasing it crosses its mean position at b and swings and reaches a at a also it reaches a height h from the ground and then again reverses and repeats its motion so now if we analyze we will find that at point a it has maximum potential energy due to its height from the ground and minimum kinetic energy because the bob momentarily comes to rest at this position now it starts swinging back and crosses its mean position at b now at b the bob is just above the ground so it has minimum potential energy and since it is in full swing it has maximum kinetic energy now it swings and reaches point c when it reaches point c again it comes to momentary rest so it has minimum kinetic energy and due to its height from the ground h it has maximum potential energy thus what can we say in this case also energy is being conserved now there is an important assumption that has been considered over here the assumption is that there is no friction due to air that is air is not providing any sort of resistance to the swinging of the pendulum so when we are considering this we can actually make these assumptions safely these relations we can put forward safely so that is an important assumption to be kept in mind that there is no loss due to friction provided by air otherwise we would not have been able to put forward these relations so as we have seen that the total energy in any system remains constant however energy is changed from one form to another so when your dad takes your car to the petrol pump for refueling the chemical energy that is present in the petrol that is a fossil fuel is converted into mechanical energy when it helps the car to move similarly when you are toasting bread at your home using a toaster the electrical energy that our home is getting and which we are plugging in the toaster to this electrical energy is getting converted into thermal energy which is being used to toast these breads and thereby we are getting these toasts